Hello there, and welcome back to A Course in Cognitive Linguistics. This episode will be about conceptual integration, or conceptual blending, as it's sometimes called. And conceptual blending is a theory that tries to explain many of the phenomena that we've already encountered in the videos about conceptual metaphor theory. However, conceptual blending is a little more inclusive than that. It tries to account for a wider range of phenomena. Now, if you want to find out more about conceptual blending, there's a book that I would recommend. It's called The Way We Think, and it's been written by Gilles Fauconnier and Mark Turner. Much of what you'll hear in this video relates to Fauconnier and Turner's work, and I'd actually like to start with an example that they give that they call the riddle of the Buddhist monk. Okay, so imagine this. A Buddhist monk begins at dawn one day, walking up a mountain, reaches the top at sunset, meditates at the top for several days until one dawn when he begins to walk back to the foot of the mountain where he reaches at sunset. Make no assumptions about his starting or stopping or about his pace during the trips. Now the riddle is this. Is there a place on the path that the monk occupies at the same hour of the day on the two separate journeys? Okay, I suggest that you pause the video here and take a few minutes to try to figure out this puzzle. Okay, right, I'll continue now. Mm, for many people, including myself, it's really, really hard to find a solution to this puzzle. You know, does there have to be a place on the path that the monk occupies at the very same hour, at the very same moment of the day on the two separate journeys. Um, but there's a solution that we can arrive at and Fauconnier and Turner point out how the solution works. So this is the monk traveling up on the first day and this is the monk traveling down the same mountain on a different day. Now, is there this spot somewhere on the path that the monk occupies at the same time on the two different days. The solution becomes apparent to many people if they superimpose the two events onto one another, okay, so that we have not one monk, but in fact two monks, you might call them, who do the journey sort of on the same day, yeah? Uh, so if you imagine that, then it seems logical that the monk traveling up must at some point meet the monk coming down. It doesn't matter whether they make pauses or if one walks faster than the other or uh, if one starts a little later. It doesn't matter. They have to meet at some point during the trip. And, um, well, arriving at this kind of intellectual insight, not through the application of logic, but rather through a process that seems imaginative and figurative, that, Fauconnier and Turner point out, is something that's really remarkable. All right, so what you've just done, if you've understood the riddle in this way, is an act of conceptual blending. And in the rest of this video, I'll spell out the details of how uh, an act of conceptual blending works. Okay. Um, conceptual integration, according to Fauconnier and Turner, has a couple of component pieces and processes that uh, we'll discuss. So there are two or more so-called input spaces or frames, yeah, the things that are superimposed and blended. There are vital relations between input spaces, sort of characteristics of the inputs that are interlinked, uh, that correspond to one another. There's integration into a blended space, yeah, the uh, mountain with the two monks traveling. There's selective projection into the blended space, so not everything from the inputs ends up in the blend. And there's compression of vital relations. I'll explain what that means in detail. And there are emergent structures in the blended space. Okay, for now, uh, this is just here so you've heard the words. I'll explain each of this. Uh, in more detail. Now, you may wonder, well, there are a few things that are recognized. Two or more input spaces, um, you know, relations between the input spaces, uh, projection. Isn't this a lot like conceptual metaphor? And I would um, certainly say, yeah, 
uh, there are a lot of aspects here that remind you of conceptual metaphor, but there are also a few things that are different. So for instance, um, well, in conceptual metaphor, we have always been talking about one source domain and one target domain. Here you can have two or more input spaces. Um, in conceptual metaphor, it's just a mapping from one domain to the other, but no, there's no integration into a, a third space. And that's what conceptual blending, in fact, claims, is that there's a third space, a blended space, that um, has so-called emergent structures that aren't found in either of the input spaces. I'll say more about this in the coming minutes. Okay, so if we apply these notions to the example of the Buddhist monk, we can say that, okay, we have two input spaces, the upward journey and the downward journey. <clears throat> we have these so-called vital relations, the correspondences uh, between the input spaces, namely there's um, this mountain uh, that is the same across the two spaces, the path is the same across the two spaces, the monk, um, and there's a difference in time. So, okay, there's also a correspondence, but this time they're not the same, they're different. All of these are called vital relations. I don't know where that term comes from. Uh, well, okay, I guess if you come up with a theory, you get to call the things uh, what you want to call them. Then there's compression. Yeah, compression. That's a term that I don't find as um, felicitous, but well. Compression means that uh, separate days in the two input spaces are compressed into a single day in the blend. Okay, so they're, they're linked into one thing. And at the same time, there's also something that Fauconier in turn called decompression, sort of the opposite of compression. In compression, you make different things the same. In decompression, you make the same thing different things. So instead of one monk, you now have two monks. And lastly, well, you arrive at a blend of two monks making the journey on the same day. You sort of flip time and identity, and instead of the same monk traveling on two separate days, you now have two different monks traveling on the same day conceptual integration. Right. Um, the emergent structure that I've been talking about is the possibility that now the monk may actually meet himself. Okay, so there's an encounter scenario in the blend that was not present in either of the input spaces. In either of the inputs, the monk is going about his business all alone, you know, there's nobody else on the mountain, but in the blend the monk can meet himself. Right. Um, more abstractly, uh, Fauconier and Turner schematize uh, the process of conceptual blending in this way, that you have a conceptual integration network, not unlike the mappings between metaphorical source and target domains that I've been showing you, uh, but in addition to the two inputs, we have a third space, which is called the blend, the blended space that results from the conceptual overlay of the two inputs. <clears throat> now, what input spaces are there? There are different types of inputs available for conceptual integration. And uh, to give you just a flavor of the variety, here are a few examples of linguistic expressions that ask you to perform conceptual blends. Uh, take this sentence, the Germans might not have elected Obama. Well, how could they? Germans are not exactly allowed to vote uh, in the United States, but that's not what the sentence means. The sentence means something different. Um, I think you'll agree that it means something like, okay, in a fictive counterfactual Germany where there is a candidate which is sort of like Obama, yeah, maybe um, with, um, uh, yeah, with, with, a, with an immigration history, um, <clears throat> representing a minority, things like that, yeah. Uh, and what the speaker expresses is that the Germans would have responded to that kind of candidate in a different way uh, from what the American 
votership has done. Okay, so the Germans might not have elected Obama. Why is it so easy for you and me to understand this kind of sentence? Well, the explanation is we can draw a number of analogies between US politics, German politics, and come up with vital relations across the two. So in both systems, we have voters. Um, in the US politics system, we have a presidency that vaguely corresponds to uh, chancellorship in uh, German politics. We have state leaders in both systems. And so these are the input spaces that we can use to conceptually integrate a counterfactual, fantastic Germany with an Obama-like candidate, which then is not uh, elected by the German public. Right. Another example here. Uh, <clears throat> I don't even know if I made up this joke. Uh, it's, it's that awful. I could have made it up myself. Uh, what if computer operating systems were airlines? Um, if you're Unix, uh, each passenger brings a piece of the airplane and a box of tools to the airport. Okay. So, um, this is a more creative blend. The input spaces are a lot more different than US politics and German politics. As one input space, we have commercial air traffic with passengers and pilots and flight attendants and planes and whatnot. And on the other hand, the second input space is the space of computing, where you have users and computer systems and ideas like uh, open source computing, okay? <clears throat> and so we draw vital relations between these very, very different uh, domains. So from um, <clears throat> planes to systems, yeah, the, the airplane corresponds to a computing system. Uh, passengers in the commercial air traffic frame correspond to computer users in the computing frame. And, well, there's really no correspondence between the open source idea and anything in the commercial air traffic uh, domain. Nonetheless, we find this open source idea in the blend, uh, which is the community-based air traffic idea. Okay, it's, it's a very original idea that you can have by combining these two very different domains into one. It doesn't always have to be that way. It doesn't always have to be that the domains that are blended are so very different. Um, quite often, <clears throat> the domains are actually nearly identical. So here's another linguistic example. I wonder if my brother and I would get along if he was still alive. Um, I don't have a brother. I have sisters, but no brother. Um, so this is fictitious. Um, but what the sentence signifies is that there is an actual experience where the ego is, well, not alone, perhaps, but there's no brother in the actual experience of the ego. And then there's a hypothetical experience of the ego with the brother. And uh, these two, the actual experience and the hypothetical, are blended into a third space where there's the, the real ego with the hypothetical brother who is still alive. Right. <clears throat> so, summing up, this question about what frames are available as input spaces. You can have near-identical scenarios that are blended into one another. There are conventional analogies, uh, US politics, German politics, where you might say, yeah, they are different, but then again, there are a lot of structural similarities. And then there are these really creative metaphors like computing and air traffic and other examples that we'll come to. Okay. <clears throat> Now, I want to say a few more things about vital relations and their compression. What vital relations are there? Well, uh, Fauconier and Turner give us a, a long laundry list of uh, vital relations, things that can correspond across frames. And they mention time, identity, space, role, cause effect, and then a bunch of others. It, really reads like a shopping list, everything but the kitchen sink. Um, and um, conceptual integration, what happens in conceptual integration is that you compress vital relations um, so that two things that are different, that belong to different input spaces, 
are understood as one single thing. Yeah? So different times and spaces are compressed into a single blended space. Let me give you a few examples of that. Um, in the monk example, we have compression of different times. Two different days are compressed into one. Um, here's a little picture uh, that says, need to lose a little weight before your wedding, question mark. And, um, well, what's compressed here, well, you notice that this is an advertisement um, addressed to the bride-to-be who needs to lose a little weight before the wedding. And uh, you see that there are these two figures on top of the cake and the groom is stretching out a hand to the bride, which seems to have, well, broken into the icing of the cake. Yeah, um, okay, so nobody is fooled into thinking that the that this is the actual bride, right? No, they're different, but there are vital relations uh, from the you know, mannequin space and the space of the actual people who are involved in the vetting. And so uh, this is how you can easily, without any effort, understand what goes on in this advertisement, <clears throat> compression of identities. Here's a more complex example uh, where different times and different identities are compressed. So what you see here in this picture is a uh, dinosaur, some, some kind of um, velociraptor, I think, um, chasing a dragonfly. And you see that, well, from one picture to the next, the velociraptor becomes more and more bird-like until in the last picture, it very much looks like a present-day bird catching the dragonfly. Now, what this, you know, the, the story that is told by this picture is one of Lamarckian type evolution. You know, you try to catch the dragonfly and that somehow passes on some characteristics to your ancestors. <clears throat> now, all of these dinosaurs and all of these dragonflies, of course, are different individuals. But what the picture invites you to think of is that, well, they, on some level, they really are the same. Yeah? So you can compress them into one animal that changes from being a velociraptor into being a little songbird. Right. And of course, this happened at different times on uh, evolutionary timescales. Another example, and this one's really funny because it's not funny, yeah? You don't look at this and go, oh, that's uh, original. No, this seems to be a very matter-of-factly representation of information. Uh, what's shown in this uh, picture here is the world record in the mile um, that was improved over several decades, yeah? So here... Uh, the, the, the first guy at the finish line, Hikam al um set a new world record in the mile, I believe it was in 1994. And uh, the other little uh, runners there, Steve Cram set the record in 85, Sebastian Coe in 79, Jim Ryan in 67, and so on and so forth. And what is represented here is um, how much faster the new record holder has been in comparison to all the previous record holders, okay? You understand this, Now I'm almost feeling a bit foolish pointing this out to you, you understand this without any problem, but if you think about it, this is a remarkable cognitive compression of information. There's uh, six different times, six different spaces, the races didn't all take place in the same stadium, and um, also a compression of different roles, yeah. Um, you have to, you have to see that all of these six were actually winners, but um, in this representation, well, there's only one winner, the current record holder, and all the others are, with all due respect, losers. Yeah. Okay. We'll come back to this picture because there's a lot of in it that merits discussion. Uh, compression of cause and effect. Yeah. I don't think I need to comment a whole lot on this. Um, there are two things that are uh, being evoked 
here and you can see the cause and you can see the effect at the same time. Right. Um, selective projection is something that we encountered already in um, conceptual metaphor theory. Okay, So not everything from the source domain ends up in the target domain. Um, typical example for this is we understand uh, scientific theories as building-like structures, so we can say things like, oh, the theory has uh, a solid empirical foundation, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so a theory has a foundation, but it doesn't have windows or it doesn't have nice staircases. So that means the projection from target, uh, from source to target is selected. Not everything is projected, and exactly this kind of thing also happens in uh, conceptual integration. <clears throat> now, what is selective projection? Not all elements of the input spaces have counterparts from one to the other, and not elements of the input spaces are projected into the blend. Um, if we go back to the world record in the mile, something that is not projected into the blend is um, this poor guy here, Noam Guinea. He came second after Hikam al Garouj. And the unfair thing is that he was actually faster than all of the five previous world record holders. Yeah? That has been a bad day for Noah and Guinea, I can tell you that. Um, well, he's probably all right now. Another example of... Um, oh no, well, let's move on to uh, emergent structure. <clears throat> What's emergent structure? Um, conceptual integration, and, and this is actually the cool thing about uh, conceptual integration, um, it's not just the mere addition of two input spaces. There's more than that. Um, the integration of two inputs creates new meanings that were not present in either of the input spaces. So in the Buddhist monk riddle, uh, we have this encounter scenario, which was not present in either of the inputs. And in the world record, um, in the mile, we have funny things like, okay, this is now a race of the winners. Okay, so the uh, <clears throat> winners are actually racing against one another. Um, and, of course, the prior record holders lose out against uh, Hikam al -Garouj. They're now losers instead of world record holders. Right, one example that you'll find discussed a lot in uh, yeah, descriptions of emergent structure is this one here, namely uh, that surgeon is a butcher. Uh, I just want to talk about briefly about it briefly because it's, it's really beaten to death in other places. Uh, What's the crucial point about that surgeon is a butcher? Well, it is when you hear that sentence, that surgeon is a butcher, the interpretation that springs to mind is, okay, that surgeon is really incompetent, careless, reckless, you know, dangerous, don't go there. And the interesting thing about that is that, um, okay, butchers <clears throat> are actually skilled uh, craftsmen. It's not a characteristic of a butcher to be careless or reckless or dangerous to visit. No, it's just through the combination of surgeon and butcher that something emerges. Yeah? And this is an emergent structure, a characteristic, a semantic characteristic that doesn't result from either of the input spaces, but just through their combination. Right. Um, now, all of the examples that I've shown you so far um, could make you think that, okay, conceptual integration, that's something that you find in clever information graphs or in uh, deliberately playful examples like advertisement pictures or counterfactual uh, sentences. But really, it's more pervasive than that. Uh, conceptual integration is at work in a lot of of different grammatical domains. Uh, for instance, in negation. So negation invites you to think about uh, the fact that something is the case, but it also could not be the case. Yeah? So integrating these two at the same time. And here, I, if you like your Lewis Carroll, um, you'll enjoy this. Uh, I see nobody on the road, said Alice. I only wish I had such eyes, the king remarked in a fretful tone, to be able to see nobody, and at that distance too. 
Okay, uh, so Lewis Carroll deliberately plays on this um, fact that <clears throat> negating a sentence always implies the other possibility of it being, in fact, positive and not negative. <clears throat> Modality. Yeah. How often have I heard, heard this? Uh, I would attend your talk, but I have a class to prepare. Um, they have to score one more goal to win, or you may now kiss the bride. Things like that. <clears throat> uh, causation. Yeah. Many languages have causative constructions, and um, well. <clears throat> causative constructions invite you to think of a cause leading to something and the absence of the cause leading to a different outcome. Yeah? So warning, uh, smoking causes impotence, uh, my inner three-year-old made me do it, um, <clears throat> and experience not possessions lead to greater happiness. You're being asked to simulate how life would be with possessions, uh, without possessions, with experience, without experience, things like that. <clears throat> Clause linkers, yeah? uh, subordinating conjunctions. Uh, he speaks excellent French even though he has never lived there, or he only won because you cheated. So again, in because there's causation, but also time. Like I, I will believe that when I see it, um, invites you to think of different scenarios and blend them into one. <clears throat> Fokony and Turner spend a lot of time uh, discussing these uh, interesting attributive constructions that are not as innocent as you might assume. So a red apple, okay, that invites you to blend the color red and this thing, the apple, and you end up with an apple that is red. Um, it's not always that straightforward. So a likely candidate is not a candidate that is likely. Uh, a safe distance, it's not that the distance is safe, it's that you are safe if you keep that distance. A guilty pleasure, okay, you feel guilty when you indulge in that pleasure. Um, or an intellectual desert, yeah, it's not that it's a particularly clever desert. It's rather that uh, you're talking about a space that is void of anything intellectual. Right. How do you arrive at these interpretations? You arrive at these interpretations through the process of blending two ideas into one. And then there are lexical items. Also here, Fokony and Turner devote a lot of space to this. Uh, there is a missing chair. Yeah, there, there is no chair. Uh, the word missing suggests to you that, okay, there should be a chair, but there is none. I have a hole in my pocket. I forgot my umbrella. That is a lie. Yeah, so uh, You see that how these lexical items have their counterparts sort of understood at the same time. <clears throat> to summarize all of this, Conceptual integration is the fusion of several input spaces into a new blended space. It involves the compression of vital relations such as time, space, identity, role, cause effect, and so on. Uh, it creates emergent structures that are not present in either of the input spaces, and it is found all over the place in language. It's not limited to counterfactual conditional clauses. It extends over a multitude of grammatical domains. Right, so that's the basics of conceptual blending for you. I want to finish up this video by outlining three differences between conceptual metaphor theory and conceptual integration theory. Okay, the two are really, really similar, and to a certain extent you could say that conceptual integration is an outgrowth, a development out of conceptual metaphor theory. <clears throat> but at the same time, there are differences that are important to keep in mind. Uh, and the first of these is that in conceptual metaphor theory, you have a binary structure of a source domain and a target domain, whereas in conceptual integration, you have several different input spaces. So, for instance, going back to the world record in the mile, we have not just two races, we have six different races as inputs. And if you ask me, okay, how many... Uh, different inputs can you have? Um, 
wow, it's you know, the sky's the limit. If uh, you take a sentence like Bill's girlfriends are getting younger and younger, none of the individual girlfriends have a um, time reverse condition. Uh, so none of them are getting any younger. But if you look at the sequence of girlfriends that Bill is dating, uh, age seems to be negatively correlated with the um, <clears throat> rank in, uh, in the sequence. Right. <clears throat> Second difference. Uh, conceptual metaphor theory is mainly about mappings from source domain to a target domain. Yeah? So that there are things lining up across the two domains. Whereas conceptual integration has this feature built in that emergent structures, things that are not present in the inputs, consist of, well, those, those emergent structures really are what makes conceptual integration particularly interesting. Um, so here again are the mappings from the argument is war metaphor. And uh, you see that there's a clean one-to-one -one mapping of things in source and target. And in conceptual integration networks, you see that there are things cropping up that are not present in either input one or input two. Uh, to remind you of what these things are, well, in the world record, we have the race of the winners and the fact that the prior record holders are losers. <clears throat> um, and then the last difference is that in conceptual metaphor theory, there is something called the invariance principle. Um, I'll explain that. And in conceptual integration, there's something similar that is called the topology constraint. Okay, now invariance, topology, what do I mean by that? In um, the invariance principle, uh, metaphorical mappings try to preserve the cognitive topology, that is the image schematic structure of the source domain in a way that is consistent with the inherent structure of the target domain. So you, when you do a metaphorical mapping, you don't just map individual parts from the source domain to the target domain, but rather what you're trying to do is to map entire image schemas from one to the other. Okay, so say that you have a metaphor that involves um, balance and justice. So justice is often understood as a kind of balance. So you map the entire balance schema with you know, a scale and one thing that is heavy and another that is light. And you map these things in a consistent way into the target domain. <clears throat> now, how does this differ from blending? Um, in blending, also, image schematic structure of the input is mapped into the blend. Yeah? Um, so, for instance, take the path schemas of the, uh, the journeys that the, the Buddhist monk is making. Um, so two of these path schemas are mapped into the blend and they in fact create a match. And what um, results from that is that the match leads to the creation of a new image schematic structure, in this case, the encounter image schema. Now the encounter is not present in either of the input spaces. So that means even though you preserve the topology of the image schemas from the inputs, the blend ends up being something substantially different. And that is something that conceptual metaphor theory couldn't really do. Okay, In conceptual metaphors, you can only map what you have in the source into the target and have it be the same. In conceptual integration, you can mix and match several image schemas, keep them whole, combine them, and end up with something that is new. Summing up, um, conceptual integration, like categorization, analogy, uh, and other processes that I talked about, is a domain general cognitive ability. It's something that human beings do naturally. It's closely related to conceptual metaphor, but it is different in three respects, namely that there are more than two input domains, not necessarily, but optionally. There are emergent meanings, and uh, 
Even though the topology from input spaces is preserved, the result may differ considerably from either input space. All right, that's it for today. Hopefully, I'll see you next time.